Olá. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. I do hope you can hear me well. I would like to welcome you. My name is Lorenza Long. I'm a technical consultant of the General Coordination for Food and Nutrition of the Ministry of Health of Brazil. And I do hope I can support you throughout this meeting. The Ministry of Health in Brazil, through a partnership with the Pan American Health Organization, has the pleasure to carry out this virtual seminar. And so, Network of External Strategies for the Reduction of the Consumption of Salt for Prevention and Control of Cardiovascular Diseases in the Americas, which is going to take place today on the February 23rd and tomorrow the 24th from 10 to 1 p.m. Brazil time. I would like to thank you all so much for your presence here. And I am going to give you some brief notices and some requests for us to start, start with the agenda. I'm going to remind you to keep your microphones on mute so we can listen to everyone. We are being recorded, as you know, and this is a way to ensure the quality of the interaction between everyone during the seminar. And please do identify yourselves, write down your name and your organization on the chat, please. And in your screen as well, we would like to see your name. We do have translation into Spanish and English. So if you want to choose the language of your preference, just put your pointer in the lower part of the screen and there is a globe there. In case there is any trouble with translation, please let us know immediately. We'll take care of that. During all of the seminar, we have a team that is going to be taking notes of the questions in the chat. So please feel free to comment, ask questions anytime you want. And then throughout our agenda, we're going to have the moments to be able to do clarifications and also having a debate with the people who are going to present and between the countries. So before we start with our agenda, I would like to pass the floor initially to Dr. Elisa Prieto. She's the director of the Non-Communicable Chronic Disease Department at the Pan American Health Organization. And she's going to be speaking on behalf of Bajo Brazil. Please, Elisa, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Lorenza. Hello, everyone. Very good morning. I would like to greet Gisele Botolini, who is the General Coordinator of Food of Nutrition of the Ministry of Health in Brazil. I'm really thankful for the presence of every one of you, especially the country representatives, the panelists and colleagues. It is such a pleasure for us to be here gathered, dialoguing with every one of you in order to advance through exchange and experiences in the elaboration, implementation and evaluation of strategies of reduction of the consumption of salt and sodium in order to control cardiovascular diseases in the countries in our region. Obesity and non-communicable chronic diseases that are related to improper eating are usually a cause of death and disability in the world. The multiple burden of malnutrition and the growth of non-communicable chronic disease have been aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic, showing the social and economical inequalities, poor eating habits and sedentary lifestyles. In the region of the Americas, uh, chronic non-communicable diseases are responsible for more than 88% of deaths and cardiovascular diseases are the main cause of death in almost all of these countries. The excessive consumption of sodium is related to an increased prevalence of hypertension, which is a risk factor for more than 40% of cardiac diseases and also strokes. In our region, the consumption of salt is way above what is recommended by the World Health Organization less than five grams of salt per day, which varies between 8.5 grams and 15 grams per person. The participation of different sources of sodium 
does vary between countries and the processed and ultra processed food consumption has been prevalent and also the additional salt that is included in the preparation of meals. Plenty of strategies are required to reduce the consumption of sodium and save lives, including regulatory diseases like labeling of nutrition in the front of the product, the reduction of processed and ultra processed foods, and measures that are focused on eating outside of the house, like food, on the food, and also more education in the on social media on these aspects involved in this problem. Many of our countries are adopting measures to reduce the consumption of salt, and this has actually increased in the past few years, but additional actions are necessary to save these lives, particularly in low and medium income countries where the risk of death for hypertension is more than doubled when compared to high income countries. In order to coordinate these efforts in a global level with an effective participation of countries to tackle all of the forms of malnutrition in a broader perspective, since 2016, the General Assembly of the United Nations has declared the decade of action for nutrition to impose the achievement of global commitments. The decade's work plan proposes the country to establish networks for action such as this one. There is no doubt that uh, the whole cooperation work in the scope of this network that has been carried out by the Ministry of Health of Brazil with the support of our SOMAS is going to contribute very importantly for the countries to reach regional and global goals like the reduction, relative reduction of 30% in the medium intake of salt and sodium by the population up to 2025. One of the goals of the PAHO's action plan to control and prevent non-communicable chronic diseases and reducing in one third mortality for non-communicable chronic diseases until the year 2030. One of the goals and objectives of the sustainable goals. I do wish an excellent seminar for every one of you. And thank you so much for your participation, and you can count on Pajo. Thank you, Lorenza. Thank you, Dr. Elisa. It is so important to know the initiatives of Pajo and WHO in this such important challenge. So now I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Gisele Bortolini. Gisele is the General Coordinator of Food and Nutrition of the Ministry of Health, and she's going to be welcoming you on behalf of the Ministry of Health of Brazil and bringing some details on today's agenda as well. Please, Gisele. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to greet Dr. Elisa Prieto from PAHO. She's a great partner. I would also like to thank PAHO, the Brazilian Agency of Cooperation, and all of the panelists and representatives of countries here with us. As Dr. Elisa mentioned, the General Assembly of the UN named between 2016 and 2025 the Decade for Action for Nutrition. In this role of actions that Brazil has fomented and developed with other countries. We are fomenting the networks of food guides and this network, which is about strategies for the reduction of the salt intake in the Americas. So this control is part of this meeting today is part of this initiative in order to make this discussion give, gain more power in the regional level. So we do have representatives of different countries here with us today. And this is a moment for the network to resume our activities because we did have a, a meeting in 2018 here in Brasilia in the headquarters of PAHO that counted on the presence of all of the countries that are part of this network and also partners from the representatives of the United Nations and the civil society. In this meeting, we have elaborated the conceptual note for the network. It was a pact between all of the countries and also a set of actions to be developed in this theme. So the agenda for these next two days is going to present innovative strategies for the reduction in the salt intake with the participation of researchers who are referencing the theme, as well as the countries and the United Nations agencies. Besides, with the resuming of our activities. We're also aiming to update the ongoing activities in the agenda for the reduction in the consumption of salt per country. So tomorrow we'll have the opportunity to learn about the advancements of the agenda in each of the countries. 
I would like to take the opportunity to thank everybody and say that from my side here, it's again, Eduardo, Jessica, Ana Maria, and Lorenza, we are following the agenda quite closely and they will be here with us fomenting the debate in the next two days. I thank the team very much. Welcome and have a great event, everyone. Thank you, Giselle. I think now we can advance in our agenda. So we are going to listen from the presentation of Professor Mary Labé from the University of Toronto in Canada. And Professor Labé is going to bring us reflections on the strategies and challenges in the Americas for the reduction in the consumption of salt. And I should remind you that at any point, you can ask questions and have your questions and doubts in the chat. And throughout the discussion, you can have a round of debates. So, Professor Marie Lambe, please, you have the floor. Talvez a gente tenha tido algum problema de conexão. Ela maybe we're having some connection problem with Professor Mary Labe. She was just here. Let's wait a few minutes. Let's see if she comes back. If not, we're going to just make a change in the agenda. Just let's wait a couple of minutes more and we're going to tell you what's going to happen, okay? Well, so I think we're going to go reach Professor Mary Labé. We are already in touch with her, but so for us to, we're going to advance in our agenda for the next theme then. So now I'm going to pass the floor to Eduardo and then Lizette Moraes Bandeira from Opaho. So they're going to contextualize a little bit on the network, some information of the previous work that the network has done, as Gisele said, well inserted in the action for nutrition. And then we can come back and try to Professor Mary, if you agree. So Eduardo, can I press the floor? Yes, perfect, Lorenza. So once again, I thank you all on behalf of the Ministry of Health for being present here representing our countries and not only the representatives, but all the other partners we have as well, academia, civil society, and all these institutions that are helping us follow through based on partnerships that are supporting countries. And part of the goal of the networks themselves is to mobilize these partnerships in order to promote more effective policies. So we're going to come back to how the construction went from 2018. And unfortunately, we were not able to have our face-to-face -face meeting in the year 2020 due to the pandemic. But ever since we were really interested in having a meeting that would contemplate every country, and I'm going to reinforce particularly our strong partnership with PAHO and anticipate many things that we're going to be listening to later, but we do have a technical group that gives assistance for the reduction of salt in the Americas. It is very active, 
the diligences were slowed down in the past two years, but the continuity of the fruits of the work of these groups have continued. And Professor Mary Lambe is going to be talking about this. And we do have also a very important project that was done in the Americas as coordinated by Dr. Adriana Blanco from Costa Rica who was simulating countries to have more effective policies and scaling up their projects. And she's going to be talking about this later. I'm just contextualizing. Specifically on the network, many countries have a very similar scenario as we can see in the country here in Brazil. And as Dr. Elisa said, there is such prevalence and impact of the burden of the non-communicable chronic diseases and particularly cardiovascular diseases. And associated to these, we have risk factors like overweight and obesity, and also the dietary risk factors, particularly involving the excessive consumption of salt and sodium. And it is also important to consider, as Dr. Elisa said, this is just a portrait of Brazil, but in other countries we have very proportions, but it's important because it shows there is no single strategy to the reduction of the consumption of salt. It's a set of strategies that should be together, uh, coming from the salt that people use to cook, salt and sodium in the processed and ultra processed foods, and also very importantly, those foods that are eaten outside of the houses, which is growing more and more in the Americas in frequency. So it's very important for us that Pau has studies, including the cost effectiveness of these initiatives and within the policies that are more cost effective to prevent death and disease, including the reduction of economic costs in the countries, not only in the health systems, but also the economies themselves, since people are getting sick, has to do directly with the policies to reduce the intake of salt. The networks themselves are seen in a space to exchange experiences. So they gather the countries. So representatives of the countries are there, but it's really important to have different partners with all the analysis of conflicts of interest we have involved, but in a way they can bring subsidies and support countries in the agendas and also promote. Eduardo, I think we have a problem with your audio. We can't hear you anymore. Can you hear me now? Okay. No, it's just, yeah, just in the end. Yeah, just in the end, we could not hear you. And maybe you can also show your slides. So just to uh, say again that this gathers representatives from the countries, but also it adds a lot to the partners for the implementation of the agenda. And the goals are also working with uh, experiences shared to improve and assess the strategies. That's also very important. The entire cycle of planning and evaluation of policies, considering the control of cardiovascular disease in the region, and also to meet the commitments that we have because uh, the World Health Organization has this commitment to reduce 30% in terms of sodium in the countries until 2025. We have other uh, moments to promote uh, agreements that we have internationally and regionally. Leo from uh, PAHO is going to speak about that. So it's a very opportune moment. In addition to having all of this work from the advisory technical group, talking about the uh, products, we also have an important moment that in addition to national goals that were established and international goals were established by the WHO, we also have limits for sodium that were established globally by the WHO. Uh, and uh, more recently, uh, PAHO updated the regional goals. So it's a very opportune moment because we have a lot of tools and a lot of information uh, for the countries to advance. And here, uh, a few of the action lines that we have and we intend to continue. And we also have a lot of uh, work uh, in parallel talking about uh, scientific evidence to reduce the consumption of salt and the impacts on health. That's very important in terms of advocacy, not only uh, in the government, but also the academia and the civil society with respect to more effective measures for the government to promote uh, uh, education on food and nutritional and nutrition and also use social marketing to promote changes in several uh, instances and also good practices. And lastly, the formulation of processed and ultra-processed foods uh, in which we have a lot of this agenda of 
goals, national, region, regional, and international ones. And lastly, there's an entire field of regulation that is also very interesting to look for in terms of foods that are rich in sodium, publicity, and food, and labeling but also labeling for nutrition to declare the sodium it's also important but also we have a step forward to have alerts that are very common in the region to show the population and foods with excessive sodium which is a critical nutrient and also the offer of food to the population and lastly eduardo eduardo this relation is important because there are food profiles uh, that need to follow the sodium profile. And we need, uh, we want to work with that. I'm not going to repeat a lot of the participation rules. Uh, it's much more to give context, especially for the partners and uh, eventually uh, new representatives that might be here. But the idea is, as I said before, it's a participation of the ministries of health. And we, uh, the idea has always been to have a flow that's least as least formal possible uh, with the fluid communication and the adhesion and uh, the exit of countries might be simply informed to the technical nations and the advisory groups so that we can continue this movement of having countries there. And all, lastly, I also I would also like to mention that we want to establish criteria for conflicts of interest in having in view the participation of partners. And here we know that the partners are exempt from conflict of interest and they support a lot of the agenda in the countries. And that is essential to ensure legitimacy, but especially effectiveness and the interest uh, in public health that we're going to have as a, the greatest goal of this network. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. Eduardo, I think we had a problem in uh, your presentation because the slides did not change. So I will suggest, the presentation was great. I think that was very clear, but I will suggest that uh, the presentation be uh, shared with the participants later on, okay? Is that all right? Well, now we will move on. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Once again, I'm going to pass the floor to Luizete from Pajo. Luizete, you have the floor. Thank you, Lorenz. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, resume the activities of the network. We had the last meeting in the end of 2018, and we also had work done uh, on this policy brief that I'm going to show you. And in this effort to exchange experiences and understand the evolution of the strategies to reduce the consumption of salt in the countries, we had, let us test the slides uh, because we're not looking at it. It's not on presentation mode, so let us just test it before you begin your lecture. Yeah, it was exactly the same thing that happened to Eduardo. I'm sorry to interrupt, but try to move the slides to see if we can do that. No. Is that on presentation mode? No, for us, it, it isn't. And try to change the slide, Luizete. I am, but it's not changing for us. Can you see the slides, everyone? It's the first slide that you see, right? Yeah, and it's not on in presentation mode. Try to move the slides, Luizete. I am, I am moving. I think we're going to need the support from the team. There's an icon below the presentation. Did you click on it? Let me see. It is on presentation mode. Can you see it? We're looking at your screen, the first slide, but not in presentation mode. 
And now we're not seeing anything else. There we go. No? You need to leave that as presentation mode, and then you can share the screen before hand. All right. Still, let's see if by changing the slides we can progress because Eduardo was stuck on the first slide. We could not look at the slides changing. There's no option to put that on full uh, presentation mode before I share my screen. I think I'll uh, keep on talking as Eduardo did and I can share the presentation later on. Is that okay? Stop sharing that then, Luizete. Yeah, so let us check because uh, maybe for the next presentations we need support if the technical team can help. Otherwise, we will always have problems with this. Thank you, Elisete. Well, as I said, then, We're talking about uh, how the network began and what we've done so far. So in 2018, we had this meeting. And in 2019, we worked on the collection of information with the countries uh, that make up the network to have this policy brief, to systematize the experiences to reduce the consumption of salt in eight countries of the Americas. The countries that answered the call that was done with the support of the PAHO offices in the countries were Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Mexico, and Peru. So this policy brief has evidence of why it's necessary to reduce uh, sodium intake for the population and what are the key strategies, what are the most effective strategies to do that. And it brings a report from the experiences of the countries to monitor the consumption of salt by population, salt, sodium, and an experience of uh, changing the foods, processed foods and ultra -pro processed foods and uh, meals with less sodium as well that's been done in the countries and labeling norms and marketing to reduce and inform and promote healthier food choices. In addition to actions to communicate and to tell people uh, to eat less salt and actions to promote healthy uh, food choices for everyone. So it systematizes the experiences. I was going to detail that more in the presentation, but I think we can share the presentation afterwards and it's going to be accessible to everyone. Uh, the idea is to bring you this policy brief that's going to be published soon. And tomorrow when we talk about our work plan and cooperation between the countries, one of the proposals is to update this policy brief because from 2018 until now, even though the collection was done in 2019, there, were, uh, there was progress in the countries. So this is the intent. And so I am available here for us to continue with our seminar. Thank you, Luizete, thank you very much. It's going to be great uh, to talk uh, further about this tomorrow, how we can update this document it's very useful. It's a rich document for all of the countries. Now we have Professor Mary's, uh, Mary Labay here from the University of Toronto, as I had uh, said before. So now I'm going to ask her to uh, speak and we will try to test and see if we can look at her slides, if this presentation issue was solved. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see it. That's and if yes, I, they can see it. Does it work the second one too? Yes, Did it great. Move? Yes. Oh, perfect, Mary. Yes, yeah. we can do that. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Mary. 
Okay, this must be our day for technology because I lost my connection a little while ago. So who knows, eh? Okay, thank you all very much for inviting me to speak uh, to you today. Um, what I'm going to do is overview the uh, work of the uh, TAG over the last few years. I have quite a bit of information here, so I won't go into all the details in each of the slides, but like the other speakers, um, I will be pleased to share the uh, presentation with you and you can look at many of the more details and links as you, I go through the slides later on. You can look at them afterwards. So I think first um, I'm going to overview the work of the TAG. It was in five main areas, um, looking at advocacy, uh, communication, but particularly social marketing, surveillance, which you'll hear from Adriana Blanco next about a lot of the surveillance work the uh, salt reduction targets, which you've heard mentioned that were recently re released in 2021, um, the issue of salt, synchronization of salt sodium with uh, fortification programs with iodine, and then of course, dissemination of the information. So we had uh, two in-person meetings prior to COVID, as well as after COVID uh, web-based meeting, and then multiple web-based uh, meetings around the target setting. Um, so just highlighting some of the works of the uh, tag and obviously many people were involved with different different people involved with different parts, but obviously PAHO has done a lot of activities every year around Salt Awareness Week, which will be coming up shortly this year. Um, they did a number of activities around country capacity building in social marketing. Um, there was an online course, there's regional trainings as well as a regional self-learning um, program offered that a number of participants completed. Um, around the uh, knowledge dissemination, a number of webinars were um, held, but I think importantly, there was an in-person meeting held a workshop in Dominican Republic uh, in 2018, attended by a number of countries. And that was important to um, bring everyone up to date with some of the most recent activities around sodium reduction, the uh, SHAKE uh, textbook package had been released just shortly before that, but some of the issues around fiscal policies, front of pack labeling, social marketing, and then an update from various countries on their recent activities regarding so uh, sodium reduction. Um, then um, the next phase was on um, um, other works and dissemination. There was a salt reduction webinar um, presenting national uh, initiatives in 2019. Um, you're going to hear a lot from uh, Adriana next about the sodium levels in packaged foods. That was a joint program with PAHO, um, the WHO Collaborating Center at University of Toronto, a number of countries, as well as uh, in Sensa in Costa Rica who coordinated it. Uh, a final technical report was produced through the funding with IDRC. It's now available as a um, some manuscripts and also through the work of the PAHO, and I'm going to speak a little bit about it uh, this morning through the TAG, was mapping the dietary salt sodium reduction po policies throughout the Americas, as well as now PAHO as an interactive tool available on their website. And then most recently last year, we held um, a update in the fall on the new uh, methodological approaches and the new sodium reduction targets for the Americas. And as I mentioned, a lot of the surveillance work was coordinated through uh, Adriana's group uh, through an IDRC funded project, but also additional funding through uh, PAHO around uh, scaling up and evaluating the salt reduction um, programs throughout the uh, Latin American countries. And you can see a number of countries participated in that IDRC program, as well as the original earlier collection in 2015 that was funded through the PAHO office. Um, there's been a number amount of work that we've led at the University of Toronto, and I put a couple of slides in at the end in case any other countries are interested in using, but we created a data collection app for called SLIC for collecting food label um, data. Um, in pictures and then uploading them into a website so you don't lose track of your data that then can be used and imported into the website for data analysis. Uh, also capacity building in social marketing, knowledge transfer. And also uh, I know Eduardo was heavily involved with uh, work on analysis of economic and health impacts of 
of salt reduction pol policies using simulation modeling programs. Um, I won't, um, I just want to bring to your attention, there's uh, documents if you're interested in the um, Michael Zimmerman, who's a member of the TAG, uh, worked with the uh, UNICEF to conduct a uh, PAHO UNICEF conduction of the first ever survey of IV nutrition in the nine Caribbean countries, and you can see them listed there. And they collected spot urines to have data on the ID status throughout uh, the Caribbean countries here. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time. This was an uh, initiative that came out of a request from the TAG on mapping the uh, sodium reduction policies throughout the Americas. And um, I want to acknowledge uh, Nadia Flexner, who did a lot of this work. She began this work when she was uh, working as a, a program policy analyst at PAHO and continued it. And she's now a PhD candidate in the Department of Nutritional Sciences here at the University of Toronto. Um, now the methodology, I won't go all of it, but it really was a multi-phase uh, methodology that really involved um, the original survey that was sent out by PAHO. And then those responses were, were uh, collabor collated together. But in, in, and not only that, a number of websites and Google scholars and documents were searched on the web to really do these electronic searches so to supplement what came from the PAHA survey with electronic searches to come up with all the policies and programs throughout the Americas. With that data, Nadia then created 34 country profiles, which were then circulated to each of the countries' um, contact point for validation and comment. Um, in the uh, report, um, there were, uh, this came out of, as I said, the original recommendation of the PAHO, PAHO uh, tag, then it was sent to the countries, and then a number of 17 countries responded originally, and then eventually with the online searches, we had data from 34 countries, of which 10 then um, validated the material and added or, and or added additional material. So, um, you probably can't read this, and I didn't mean for you to be able to read it, but this is the type of table that's found in the report. And you can see over the top there, are, it's divided into a number of different areas. And then down the left, all the results from each of the individual countries. And if I'm to summarize it <clears throat> in the next slide, this gives you an overview of some of the results. In other words, the number of types of country, number of countries that have various types of policies in, or programs in the various areas that relate to sodium reduction. So for example, 24 of the countries of 34 actually specifically mentioned sodium reduction policies as part of their control and prevention of NCDs, while something like taxes, fiscal policies, none of the countries in the Americas currently have uh, fiscal taxes around sodium, specifically targeted at sodium. Although, for example, Mexico has a taxes on junk food, which salty snacks are included in that. So you could probably say that they have there. And a few countries now have restrictions on marketing of unhealthy foods. And a number of countries now have mandatory labeling and or voluntary labeling that includes sodium. And so you can see that this is a very useful tool for, for you as um, folks, policy folks working in the area of sodium reduction to check and see who else has got programs or policies in various areas that you may be considering in your country and be able to look up and the source documents are also provided. And to give you an idea, for example, this really was a useful exercise because it shows that there's been a huge progress in the Americas from example from 2014 when the first um, review was done by um, the group at George Institute. You can see that only one country in the Americas, for example, had front of pack labeling. And by 2019, five countries have it. Um, from, it increased from four to 12 countries with food reformulation um, activities, interventions in public settings, for example, setting sodium limits for food sold in schools or restricting the types of foods available in school settings or other public settings. It's now 13 countries and 19 countries around the Americas are now monitoring the sodium levels in packaged foods. You can see that this policy um, 
radar is very useful and hopefully it'll be updated over time that you will continue to provide information so that we can have a good picture of the progress within the Americas. And so for example, and I think this is really important that if we look at from when we first established the PAHO targets and talked about it in the establishing the regional tag in 20, 2009, there are only two countries with activities specifically directed at sodium reduction in 2009. And by 2019, 60, 16 countries now have some of the WHO best buys implemented within their countries. So as you can see over the years, there's been great progress, but obviously out of the 34, we're only halfway there. And so we really hope that through meetings such as this, we can help facilitate additional progress throughout the region to, into other countries. And if you were to go to the PAHO website, you can see uh, a large number of, of activities that you can do using an interactive tool that PAHO has set up. And so there is, for example, the number of best buys. You can see that the number of best buys at a country level, and it's color coded, coded by the number of best buys that have been implemented by country. You can also take a look at the various policies and say, for example, are there government policies in development or no policies in a variety of areas? So, for example, of the best buys, you can look at it here and you can see that for reformulation voluntary, 11 countries have now have national level, while, um, and I don't remember what that is, but a fewer, I think that would be nine do not have policies yet for voluntary, but you can see two of them have mandatory reformulation policies. And you can now go through and list and see what's available in the various countries by policy or program. And you can also then do it by country. You can do a search by country and then see the um, policies that they have or legislation or programs that they have instituted with the uh, date that certain policies have been implemented or instituted in various countries. So I encourage you to go to this website. It's a, fast, a valuable resource for all of you to use in your uh, policies and programs uh, focused on sodium reduction. Excuse me, I'm just gonna take a glass of water. I'm going through fast, excuse me. <clears throat> so I'm going to shift gears now and I wanna spend the second part of my presentation really talking about the updated regional sodium reduction talk, uh, targets. And this work was funded through uh, the Resolve to Save Lives Initiative, which is a PAHO and working with the WHO Collaborating Center at the University of Toronto that I lead on nutrition policy for Crohn's disease prevention, as well as collaborators at the Ontario Tech University led by Dr. Joanne Arcan. And we had two sub, a tag subgroups. So in other words, of the whole tag, and I'll mention them later, we had a subgroup who really helped us and way, they worked with us through a number of meetings to really do the technical work in coming up with the new sodium reduction targets for the Americas. And so they were, um, the methodology was presented to the full tag, then the subgroup went away and worked on it. We met again with the full tag, overviewed our proposals, and then at a final meeting in February 2021 to uh, agree to the final methodology and the final targets for the sodium reduction targets in the Americas. Now, I want to uh, focus, point out that in 20, our original targets in 2015 that were established, we had 18 food categories that had targets. Now, we have, and I'll go through it with an example for bread. We now have set 16 food categories, but 75 subcategories. So really what we were able to do is take a food category like bread and now break it down into subcategories so that we could actually refine the targets and make it more specific to different types of foods within a food category. And there was a number of reasons why we updated the sodium uh, regional targets. It was consistent with our consensus statement in 2015 that we were going to update the targets. And as I show you, many foods had already met the 2015 targets when we did analysis in 2017 and 2018. Many more countries have now established sodium reduction targets. So we had a lot more targets to work from than what we did in 2015. 
And I think most importantly, we had a large amount of sodium monitoring data available. And so that was really, we ended up with a data-driven approach that was really driven by the data that we had in the Americas. And I think it was also important that there were a number of other policy initiatives that were happening throughout the Americas. We had uh, a PAHO nutrient profiling model that we could use. A number of countries have set uh, front of pack labeling, either implemented it or proposed legislation, and they have set targets for sodium. So obviously we wanted to be aware of those targets and have um, consistency in approach. And of course, as was mentioned earlier in 2021, the WHO came out with its global benchmarks for sodium, which we also consulted and made sure that we were consistent with the WHO global benchmarks. But of course, being more specific and targeted to the Americas where we had data for the Americas. So I'm briefly in the next few minutes going to give you an overview of the methodology, but there is a technical document that you can refer to for the actual data. Um, I want to give acknowledgement to the members of the full um, collaborating center that I work with who worked on this work, as well as importantly, the members of the target setting subgroup of the TAG spent a huge amount of efforts helping us come up with these targets. And you can see their names here. And a number of meetings that we had with the full tag, obviously in Zoom, just like today, and you can see members here. And they were really important to review our data, discuss approaches, and to make final recommendations on both the approach and the targets that the tag proposed to PAHO. What changed with this set of targets is we had a lot more data to work with. We now had um, targets in four different countries. Uh, originally, in, and excuse me, in 2015, we only had targets in four countries, but very little monitoring data. While setting the 2022 to 2025 data, we now had target data from 10 countries. We also reviewed the WHO and UK um, draft guide at targets or their targets, and we now had monitoring data for 19 countries within the uh, Americas, which now have been published in uh, several manuscripts that are available, and I can send you links to those documents. What we now have, and just to overview, is as before, we now have targets expressed as milligrams per 100 grams for 2022, 2025, which will be our ultimate targets, and we've given some long-term targets that would ultimately help us reach our 30% reduction. We also have expressed them as milligram per kcal, which is consistent with the PAHO nutrient profiling model if countries want to know where are the really high sodium dense foods. And this is a brief, and I know it's a lot on here, just showing how we did it. So we had from the monitoring data from 2015, we had the median sodium levels in all of the food categories. We had the 25th percentile and the 70th, a 75th percentile, as well as a list of all the targets that we could use as a feasibility to see if our targets were consistent with the targets set in other countries of the region. And we had, for example, for bread, we had data for almost 1800 bread products in the region. So using these medium data, we now could take bread, which is one large category, and divide it into four subcategories where we were now able to give more specific. And you can see the breads range from 400 median for your just your regular pantry and bread rolls to things like almost 700 for tortillas. So obviously it made more sense to have more fine tuned targets rather than one target for all types of bread. And so I use these two examples. You can see we started with the median level. And then the 2022 targets are based on a 15% reduction. And the 2025 targets are based on a 30% reduction consistent with the um, WHO recommendations of a 30% reduction, as well as we then cross-checked with the other targets in to make sure that those were feasible targets that we were setting. And if you go to the uh, document, which is available on the PAHO website, you can see now that the final targets, and I didn't go through in milligram per um, keg kilocal, but you can see the approach was done exactly the same. So the report has the targets expressed in both sets of units. 
And now I'm just going to spend the last minute or two with a, a, a plug. Um, and this plug is um, for work that we've done at University of Toronto, but also to say that this resource is available for you. I know a number of countries are using it. And if you want to reach out to us or through the PAHO office afterwards, I'm sure we can help you. We have a Flip data collector app, which it's an iPhone app that you can scan food products in grocery stores, upload all the pictures, tag them, upload them onto the website. It's available on a cloud. We set up different cloud websites for all the different countries. And then you can save pictures very easily to search, to scan them, to um, enlarge them and enter the data into the FLIP database for your um, data, sodium or other nutrients if you care to. And importantly, this is not fully a functional yet, but we have now done in Canada, we've developed new technologies that based on optical character recognition. In other words, the computers are actually reading the nutrition facts table. And then we've used machine learning and artificial intelligence to teach our computers with, based on our old flip data that we collected in 2017 and 2020 to read, learn how to read nutrition labels. It's been done in Canadian for Canadian um, nutrition facts tables. And we're going to be hopefully with work with funding that we have this year with um, PAHO to be able to, and the uh, result to save lives funding to hopefully develop a Spanish version and we'll see how it works. So I can't say that it's working yet, but with our funding, we hope to develop one. So it may not work for all of your fax tables, but it might really cut down in the amount of work that you manually have to enter into either spreadsheets or the FLIP database. So with that, I want to thank you all very much for your attention. The updated uh, PAHO regional sodium reduction targets are available on the website, as well as a copy of the detailed technical report that was used to develop those targets. And there's a link to the um, technical re uh, report available in the regional um, target report. So thank you all very much. And um, I know that some of you may have questions later on. I'd be pleased to answer them. Muito obrigada, professora Mary Labé, pela excelente apresentação. Bom ver. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. It's so good to see the progress in the region, the policies for reduction, and I am sure that we're going to have plenty of questions. And I'm going to suggest they are going to pass, move on to the next presentation, and then we'll have a round of sessions and a session on questions and doubts at the end of the next presentation. Thank you very much, professor. So next, I would like to pass the floor to Linda Medevin, who is a food and nutrition assistant for physical activities in schools from the Department of Non-Communicable Diseases and Mental Health from PAHO, and he's also going to bring us information about the reach of reduction in the consumption of sodium in the region. So I'll pass the floor to Leo, please, Leo. Okay. Muito obrigado. Uh, obrigado. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I will share my screen. Uh, Vamos, let's see if we manage to, to see because we, we had some problems with the transmission. Let me check. Let's check. Um, share screen. Can you see it? You can't see it. Mm, not yet. Let's try. Yeah, you... Yes, let's see. See? Okay. Uh, then Great. No. I'll start. Yes. Okay, just try oh, to can see it. one slide. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Leo. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, muchas gracias. Entonces, es un gusto estar uh, con ustedes. Uh, Thank you. It is a pleasure to be with you working in the network, which is really important, especially to advance and the salt reduction policies in the region. And I do think 
that you share experiences is very useful because you can see here because there is a very good basis for evidence that is very scientific, which is related to the implementation. So now we're having difficulties in many countries that are having the same difficulties. And this is why I believe that the work in network is very important to analyze together how we can advance. So we have here, let's say the basis and we do know that 80 percent of the deaths in our region is due to cardiovascular disease and the majority of them is caused by hypertension and this is in the vast majority is due to the high consumption of salt as we can see the current consumption of salt is two or three times higher than it's recommended by the WHO. So we should be ingesting less than five grams a day, which corresponds to a small spoon. And we are here taking up to 15 grams a day. And the great part of this salt is found in food, which is processed and ultra processed. And we can see here that the consumption of these food groups is more and more high. It's higher and higher. So this part of reformulating these foods is also very important. Let's put into practice policies to reduce the consumption of processed foods in themselves because it is a trend of continuing with the reduction of 10% in the salt content, which is not going to make much of a difference. So WHO has developed the package shake, which includes five components. This package is the most effective if we implement these components in a simultaneous manner. So what we want is to have a gradual and progressive reduction on salt intake. And this will lead us to lower blood pressure and lower risk of strokes and coronary disease and cardiovascular disease, and that also reduces mortality. This has effects on health, but also on the economy. The workforce is going to be more productive. Healthcare systems are going to have less patients and also the economy gets better. So it's related to a lot of things. We have five components. The first one is surveillance. It's the S from surveillance in English. And H is because the mobilization of the sector of the industry. And that consists basically on reformulation policies. A is adoption of norms, especially for frontal labeling and also to avoid mistaken publicity for food. K is for knowledge, to educate and communicate so that the population understands that it's important to consume less salt. And E has to do with the surroundings, to have uh, policies so that you have healthier sur surroundings in terms of food. If we talk about surveillance, we have three subcomponents. The first one is to measure and monitor the use and consumption of salt. It's important to know that 
salt comes from food and restaurants and everything that is added during uh, the preparation of food or on the table and also what's hidden in processed foods. So we can think about better strategies considering all of that. And that helps us have a baseline in surveys. In the WHO, we have a module that includes the consumption of salt by means of uh, urine samples. So this is what we recommend. We also have the subcomponent of measuring and monitoring the amount of salt in foods. Dr. Mary Lavi talked about the application of this FLIP app. And this is an example of a tool that we can use to monitor the salt content in foods. And this can be done in stores and also restaurants. We can monitor all of that and we can also assess and see if we are progressing in terms of the amount of sodium that we have in our foods and the food supply. And we can also have a chemical analysis done directly on the foods. In a project that we have currently with uh, result to save lives with a few countries that took part in an agreement, we are collecting new data and Uruguay is also doing a chemical analysis directly on the foods. In addition, it's important to have surveillance to monitor and evaluate a plan to reduce salt and to see how we can uh, advance, right? We also have H in our acronym, and it is related to the reformulation of food so that they have less salt. I believe Dr. Mary Love explained the new goals very well and the process of selecting the categories and the subcategories of foods, establish uh, goals for reduction. In our case, we established maximum values. Other countries established weighted averages and reductions in terms of percentages with respect to the sales as well of the products. But this is a bit more complicated because you require more data to do that. The goals can be voluntary or mandatory. According to our experience, we saw that sometimes the voluntary ones uh, were very weak and we do not advance much. So we thought it would be best to have mandatory goals because in addition to everything, um, the whole industry has to participate. It's mandatory. So everyone has the same advantages and disadvantages. In addition, it's something that if you have a law, even if you have a new administration in the government, uh, they have to follow. So it's much more effective to have mandatory goals. Another issue is the frontal labeling. I believe most of you are familiar with that because they make it very clear for the consumer to see the excessive salt or saturated fats, sugars. The countries are implementing that more and more. Recently, Argentina also adopted a law 
that is very much in line with the goals and reference points of adopted by PAHO. This is a system that has been more effective. Also, countries outside the region are considering doing the same thing. Another theme is to implement strategies to fight against the wrongful promotion of foods. We can see that someone can see a package saying that it has very little salt, but at the same time, it has a lot of sugar or the other way around. So one of the positive aspects to put that on the forefront is there, but at the same time, these foods can have a high content of salt. K has to do with educational strategies and communication strategies. It is especially important if you use a lot of salt uh, domestically, but it's also important for advocacy and reformulation programs. So we can use that in different ways. You can have social demand for regulatory measures. And it is often said that Communication is not very effective, but it also depends a bit on how it's done. We've also seen how good planning and good formative research and good education with good strategy, and we're talking about social marketing. You can uh, see the validation of the messages and the groups following this strategic methodology, and that can be much more effective. So here you can see that we have a social marketing course, a social marketing program in our virtual campus of public health. It's a free course. It has 100 hours. It includes five courses. It's actually a program that is focused on the risk factors for non-communicable diseases, you can access that in English or Spanish. So we invite everyone to uh, take this course so that you can become more proficient at social marketing. This is also a component for the surroundings, the environment, especially for shopping and public places, but you also have regulation to establish limits. Hello, I'm, I'm hearing someone else. Someone has the, if you could please mute your microphones. So especially in schools and hospitals, workplace, We can have these goals, and a lot of schools have done that. Please mute your microphone. Fabiana? Thank you. Sorry, Leo. Please, please proceed. No problem. Thank you. So here we have a publication that Mary Lab presented. Uh, that's a mapping that we've done with Nadia Flexa. She began doing that when she was working as a consultant with us in PAHO. And she did a mapping of all of the policies and initiatives in the Americas. And this is available. You have all of the data available on our 
data portal that was launched two months ago. I think it was in January, right? And that's called uh, Enlace. And you have uh, salt reduction policies, and you also have trans fatty acid elimination industrially and many other policies. And also data for risk factors and non-communicable diseases. It's called Enlace, and I recommend it for you. You can take a look at the portal often. Here you can see the number of countries with different policies. You can see a spreadsheet by country and how they're doing their policies. So now I'd like to talk to you a bit about what we're doing with our results here and a grant that we received and that it benefits Costa Rica, Ecuador, Panama, Uruguay, and also Bolivia is included in this grant. We've done diagnosis with different actors to see what would be the best strategy to implement all of these policies from this SHAKE packet and also the new regional goals. So we explored the perceptions of the different actors and we've done mapping to see the level of interest and political influence, either pro or against what we are suggesting, what are the barriers, strengths, and opportunities to promote the policies and also to promote the participation of the actors in regard to uh, taking part in codex meetings in which important decisions are made about health and not just uh, people from uh, the sector, but it also have representatives from the industry and the minis uh, ministers and representatives from the government. So a few findings that we have is that we have a heterogeneity with respect to the state of implementation, political context, technical capacity, but we also have similarities in terms of the lobby of the industry arguments, needs and capacity building, and the need to improve and have more participation in these codex meetings. Uh, we also saw opportunities to promote the policies according to the context, and also opportunities for collaboration between the civil society and the academy, governments and international agencies and also integration of agendas, nutrition, obesity, non-communicable diseases, iodine uh, addition to the salt, and by means of good salt reduction policies, you have other policies that are strengthened for example, when you talk about frontal labeling and critical nutrients, worldwide, there were uh, warnings for sodium and salt. So we've also been able to work more on this concept based on all of that. And the contrary is also true. If you have public policies to buy foods in schools, and if you have criteria, you can also have uh, an advocacy uh, for this uh, salt content criteria. There's also the need to have a regional collaboration and exchange of information, for example, by means of this action network on the reduction of salt. I already mentioned the little participation in the codex uh, discussions by the ministries of health. It's also important to think about conflicts of interest because 
especially with respect to reformulation, there's resistance in the industry. So it's important to sit on the same, to have a talk with them on the same table so that we can manage conflicts of interest. There's also a challenge, concern on how to do uh, and how to make these policies reach the population. So the following steps, we have uh, to generate spaces for discussion to define a route uh, to strengthen the adoption and implementation of the policies recommended in this shake packet of the WHO. And we need to have also, uh, and to take a look at the updated uh, goals of the WHO for the reduction of sodium. Dr. Mary Labe uh, explained in details the methodology that was necessary uh, in order to update these goals because a lot of products were meeting the 2015 goal that was also a commitment to update them and each you know each goal needs to be updated those that are established now until 2025 we also need to update them in 2025 the green document is the document that shows the goals themselves and the methodology and there's a blue document that is a tool to face uh, the diseases and the load. It's a more political document, a bit shorter. It can be used for advocacy. And it also includes an, an attachment with frequent questions. So it's important to convince, let's say, the food industry, or at least to manage counter arguments, let's say, and why it's important to implement these goals that are viable and that will be more effective if they're mandatory. These are the 16 categories. These are the goals, the maximum ones by category for 2021, 2025. We've also done a comparison with the profile of nutrients from PAHO, and there are products that are They have a lot of sodium and we included that. So we can see if they meet the challenge and if they're still high on sodium, they will still have this uh, nutritional warning seal. That's why we're doing the comparison to see if there are other policies that are different from the reformulation, like this uh, pa shake package shows that includes including also the norms for the purchase of industrialized food from the public sector and including as well the reduction of the restrictions in advertisement. So there are certain things that the countries should do to implement the goals. And we do hope to have more time tomorrow for discussion in this sense. It is important to have a leadership of the highest level because no one alone in the nutrition department, uh, we cannot influence on the non-communicable diseases. This should be led to the highest level on a national initiative to reduce the exposure of the population of foods with excessive salt content and adapt these goals as tools to reduce the content of salt and processed and ultra-processed foods through a law 
that is going to be implemented and that is going to support the other policies that are tackling the consumption of processed and ultra processed food and also promote multi sectoral action to prevent the possible conflicts of interest that could arise. So I want to thank everyone who is with us in this process. And we have the collaboration from the University of Toronto, coordinated by Professor Mary Labbe and the technical assistant group of PAHO in the themes of salt reduction and results to save lives and other projects that are supporting us in a way that they can help change the society and all the member states. And Bajo is together with you, supporting you in this effort. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leo, for your such complete presentation. I can see here it's 11.24 right now, so we do have some time until the break. And I would like to suggest for anyone who has a question or concern or a doubt regarding the previous presentations, Eduardo Lizetti, Professor Mary, Dr. Leo, if anyone wants to raise their hands or put the information in the chat, Anna and Jessica, this would be a good moment for exchanging ideas and experiences and asking questions about all of these strategies that Professor Mary and Leo have brought. Good morning, everyone. For the moment, we only have one question on the chat. It was sent by the representatives of Ecuador, sent by Daniela, and they would like you to share the dates of the training course, please. Do you want to say it? Or in case you don't, can put it on the chat. And in case you want to say anything about the presentations that were done, please feel free to use the Zoom tool to raise your hands because we're going to organize the, the order of your speeches. It's about the social marketing course. Exactly. The question is for Leo. Leo, would you like to answer about the social marketing course? You have the floor. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm going to put the link on the chat. So this is the course on social marketing launched a year and a half ago. That's the link, which has the launch program. And it also has the recording on the launch that took place precisely with the University of South Florida, which is a collaborating center with WHO in terms of social marketing. So this is a program that we had created before in the reduction of salt, and we have expanded to other themes that are related to risk factors, like physical activity, healthy eating habits in general, and also breastfeeding, because the most important thing would be for a good methodology to be used and a good planning process. So in this sense, 
I can tell you for sure that there is an introductory course that we've had more than 11,000 participants so far, both for the version in Spanish as well as the English version. And there is a course two to five where those who are participating will learn how to do an informative investigation and research that focuses on a problem and develop communications through social mechanisms towards planning and validating messages and validating materials and also doing the evaluation. So I can also talk about some of them if you want. In this year, we're launching the new social marketing manual or a guide to reduce the consumption of salt. And there is another guide, but it's now seven years old. So this year we want to publish a new manual. So uh, we'll be in the virtual PAHO campus and this is available for free for everyone. Thank you, Leo. And can you share the link later for the course? I already have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Perfect. And I see here that Beatrice has posted a question about what is the main sodium source in Latin America. We're talking about 70% in ultra processed. And I do believe that our intake of salt has to do with the, uh, the addition of salt in the kitchen and in the table, right? Who wants to answer this question? Professor Mary, also someone who was, was speaking in the first round. Can you please say some words to answer to Beatrice Champagne from CRAS? I could start and later someone can add. Yes, you can pass the floor. Perfect. Thank you. If in the industrialized countries where we have 70 or 80% on the consumption of salt, in Latin America, the situation is a little less clear. There are countries where there is still much food being consumed in their fresh forms. And I don't believe that this could be done because we can see there is more consumption of processed foods and there is a higher consumption of salt there. So it is important to keep promoting the consumption of grains, vegetables, fruits, and leafy greens and less refined foods. But at the same time, it is a reality in which the trend is towards the consumption of processed foods that are much more. And this is already ongoing and we see that these changes are quite fast and eating habits now are so much different, you know, almost 20 years later. So we will have to work necessarily in all of these sources, in all of this. It is such a battle that has different fronts, you know. So this is what I can tell you about this. Thank you, Leo. And keep monitoring what's going on with the population in order to choose the most effective policies. Of course. I, I can add a little bit more to what Leo said. He's absolutely right. It varies throughout the Latin American countries. Some countries are have much more westernized diets, as I call it, with diets um, dependent on a lot more packaged and processed foods. So for those countries, 70, 80%, as you said, will be coming from the packaged foods. Other, food, other countries rely more on less processed foods, but then they add this, so much of the sodium will come from cooking and at the table. And I think one of the important things that, for example, I know Adriana Blanco showed, pointed it out at one of her earlier tags that 
many of those countries also blend and use a lot of what do we call, you know, powders, um, uh, concentrates. And so even if they're using um, less processed foods, they often add a, what now are processed seasoning agents. And, um, and those are contributing a lot of sodium because they're almost flavors plus pure sodium. So it, it really does vary by country, but also be very aware of those seasoning sachets and broths and powders. They add a lot of additional sodium to the diet, even for the countries who are not consuming highly processed foods, the consumer will often add additional sodium sources to the, not only just to processing and cooking as regular table salt, but through these uh, condiments as well. Uh, I would like to add something else to this, which I think it's essential that both Leo and Mary stated, is that this variety we have in our region highlights that the group, the technical assistance group has a publication that is all called Salt Smart America, a guide for country action, which I'm going to put the link here for you. It is important for bringing so many tools that are essential for this issue that Leo highlighted, which is monitoring the sodium sources. So for a country to act and to start a sodium reduction policy, it is important to recognize how much sodium is consumed and where it's coming from precisely so we can delineate the best strategies in order to contemplate all of the sources, like the example from Brazil, in which we do have higher participation of the addition salt, as Beatriz highlighted. We also have a change that we have seen through the populational survey, which is a reduction in the consumption of salt and substitution for processed and ultra-processed foods, which should be adapting the strategies, including a dialogue with the food guides, like the Brazilian food guide that is working in the perspective of industrial processing of food, but also bringing specific messages about about addition salt in the culinary and cooking ingredients. Perfect. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Leo. We do have a couple more minutes. Does anyone want to ask any question or should we go to the break now? And yes, you're welcome, Beatriz. I believe we are doing well on time. So I'm going to suggest a quick break. Let's take 10 minutes. It's 11.35 now in Brazil. So we would come back at 11.45 for the second part of the agenda, having a presentation from Adriana Blanco next. And we're going to continue talking about the strategies adopted in each of the countries. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll see each other in 10 minutes, okay? Thank you. Bye. See you. If you agree, we can come back for the second part. I can see Adriana. We are following our time here. So coming back to our agenda, now I'd now like to walk to pass the floor to Adriana Franco Mesa. She's from the Costa Rican Institute of Investigation on Safety and Nutrition in Ciencia and she is going to provide us with a bit more uh, details on the project from the International uh, Development uh, Center about sodium policies. I think it's going to complement uh, very nicely our previous talks. So Adriana, you have the floor. We can look at your slide and we can begin. We cannot hear you, Adriana. There we go. Good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's truly a pleasure to be able to be here with you, sharing this space, this space for reflection, for exchange of information and planning. Well, the guiding philosophy for this project was that research activities and capacity 
scaled in Latin American countries that did not have policies or had very little policies for sodium reduction thanks to the support of more experienced countries. These are the ones that provided technical assistance to us, but also a few Latin American countries that are way more advanced in this area. This project is found in this book here. It's called Scaling Impact Innovation for the Public Good. That was published by Robert McLean and John Gargani with the support of IDRC. And we have this link that I left here for you. It's a new practical focus to scale the positive impact of the investigation and innovation. And it gathers information, not just from Latin America, but also other continents like uh, average and low income countries. So here it's a bit of what I'm going to talk about. And so let us begin. As was mentioned before, salt reduction is a best buy for non-communicable diseases interventions. So it's a cost-effective intervention. Dr. Leo also mentioned that most Latin American countries consume excessive sodium two to three times what is recommended. And that also increases the risk for hypertension and cardiovascular diseases. Very few Latin American countries have specific sodium reduction policies that was also mentioned by Dr. Mary. Only six countries uh, had those policies specifically for that. And we know that our countries lack scientific capacity in, in some areas, and we also need national data. We still need some of them, but we are advancing, but we need recent data as well. And we also need resources to conduct research and knowledge transfer. We all, we all go through that. And also we need to engage policymakers in implementing these initiatives. Really a lot of that was the basis of the execution of this pro project and that's what we've been dealing with. Well, this is just to present the milestones that we had in Costa Rica before the development of this project. And you can see that in Costa Rica, we had a series of policies when this project came about. The project began in 2016 and it ended in 2020. And precisely in the pandemic, we had uh, problems. And so when the pandemic began in Costa Rica, that's when we stopped. And there were a series of events that were project of investigation. We participated in a lot of them. And we also participated since 2009 in the expert group of the uh, PAHO. Well, who were the participants in this project? We have three groups of participants, three roles. We have researchers who provided technical assistance to us, and we had institutions that worked with the administration. 75% of the funds came to Costa Rica and they were managed by the fund foundation of the University of Costa Rica. And then they went to the third parties. Uh, the University of Toronto and the University of Ontario received the funds directly. All the others we had to manage here in Costa Rica. And that was a great effort of coordination because IDRC kept a local currency in each country and we had to play with all of these changes in currencies. Well, among the researchers, we have different institutions from five countries and you know uh, who they are. And these institutions are working uh, in a consortium. And the technical assistance was crucial. 
they were from the collaborative centers of uh, Bajo, Canada, and the United States, the University of Toronto, and the University of South Florida. And we had universities from Canada that wanted to help as well, and from Ontario that since the beginning uh, was in the project. And then we had Pajo, of course, and all of that, Washington was working with that. We began with uh, Dr. Branko and uh, uh, somebody else later on. And then we had an Inter-American Heart Foundation and Dietitians of Canada. In total, we had 78 professionals involved directly with this project in the technical assistance. Really, it was a great uh, effort of coordination and work. Well, what is the main objective of this project? The main objective was to promote policy innovations for sodium reduction in food systems of Latin America by strengthening and evaluating the scaling up of existing salt reduction programs and supporting the development of new programs by means of a consortium of institutions from Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, Paraguay, and Peru. The project had five components, many of which are precisely included here. Uh, the first one was the food environment. And in this food environment, we worked with food labeling by means of this FLIP app that was mentioned, and then we analyzed the amount of sodium. And then we had a direct analysis done by a laboratory in certain foods that we will get to know now. We also assessed behavior changes by means of uh, informative sessions. And then we had training uh, that we received from uh, the University of South Florida. And finally, with the production of a regional social marketing plan that we're also about to get to know. And then we worked on impact and health economy assessment. This we only worked with two countries, Brazil and Costa Rica. And we also worked on knowledge transfers. I'll explain how that was done by means of a plan. And what we did was precisely to transfer all of this knowledge in a coordinated manner. And finally, we had an evaluation of everything that we had done. Well, I'll begin basically from the end to the beginning, but this was the model. To begin the project, we had a logical model. The consultant was Dr. Joanne Con Arkin from the University of Ontario. We began with the objectives of the project. And for that, the team established the outputs, the expected results, uh, the outcomes. And then we had that for the short term, for the medium term, and for the long term. And what would be the success indicators that we wanted to have? That was followed by this baseline survey done by PAHO in 2016. And that's when we began to execute the project as well. And that was done by PAHO and that served as a baseline for further analysis later on. A bit before the project ended, which was in the beginning of 2020 in March, in 2019, in the end of the year, Dr. Khan and her team conducted the evaluation of the indicators uh, and the evaluation of the indicators for success. And they also explored facilitators and barriers and the implementation of these sodium reduction policies in the five Latin American countries. All of this information, the outcomes, the results, they're all in a document in this preliminary report in these uh, links. And I say that this is all preliminary because at this time, we have uh, 
scientific article that's being reviewed uh, for publication. And it's the information is going to be uh, a bit more detailed. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the different outcomes, different results for each component that I mentioned before. Before all of this, we needed to have this capacity building and we had trainings, we had a great deal of a number of courses. These are a few of them. For example, in the FLIP, we were trained by uh, Dr. Mary LaBay's team and also social marketing. Uh, we were trained by Dr. Paja Mamuda from the University of South Florida. We had a lot of activities, workshops, and also a three month course that we took. And we were also trained on the impact on the health and also on economic impact from these interventions by means of these two models. Here we had uh, the personnel from the University of Laval in Canada, and then uh, Dr. Nielsen from the Ministry of Health in Brazil. We also had training on knowledge translation and transfers so that we could achieve the outcomes and we could start coming up with plans. So what were the contributions? Well, some of them have been named today. And one of them was precisely to have a protocol that was done. And this is also available in the virtual library. And if you look for this library and you put the name of the project, you're going to find a huge number of documents related to this protocol. And this documents everything that we did uh, in our work using the FLIP study and that how we adapted that to the countries in Latin America. So that was a version that was called FLIP LAC. And this is one of the tools and also an assessment of how the regional goals were met. These are the averages, as you can see, those are higher than 8%. So they were meeting uh, the goals, they needed to be updated. And we could show that this information was necessary. All of this was published. And this was all done in uh, here. We have a publication in this nutrients journal and you have all of the results there. And finally, uh, everything was used to come up with, uh, to update the regional goals of PAHO. And that was work done last year and the year before. And it ended until October last year. So you can see that this component had a big contribution, not only for our countries, but also for the region, Latin American region, and for the Pan American organization. Another use of this information that had implications, political implications, it was the assessment of the national situations for the sodium reduction goals, and that allowed to monitor them. And this is all published here. You can see in Argentina uh, with its law in which 90% of the products already met the national goals of Argentina. And here we have Costa Rica in which we have a public-private uh, alliance in agreement with an association of the chamber and 87% meeting. And this led both countries to decide that they needed to update their goals in addition to the regional ones, because there are a few products and situations that are a bit specific. In the case of Costa Rica, there was a renewal of this alliance and we are 
in the process of updating the national goals. In the case of Argentina, we're going to leave for the next presentation. Well, with regards to the content on food, this was interesting because in this opportunity, we're working on food that is made and we have artisanal foods, fast foods and street foods. In each of the countries, we selected 20 products in total. So we're going to look at what we have in terms of the tapioca analysis in Brazil, in Sao Paulo. And in the case of Paraguay, the meat stays, in my cookies in Argentina, as well as meat tacos. And we have chicken broth in Peru. And we have countless results. Some have been published, some have not. So this is a summary in which we compare the results from the five countries. And you can see that the countries that always had a high level proportionally, at least, were using as a profile the traffic light. And in this moment, we did not have a determination in the calories, so it was not possible to access the profile of PAHO. But we have used this very on your chart, and this is the cut points. We see that Argentina, Costa Rica, Peru, they have their products. And we can say that the content of salt is medium, 320 to 600 milligrams. While in other countries, like in Brazil, Paraguay, we have a prevalence of foods that have a high content of sodium, which is important because this group of foods we have not paid attention to because they are not paying attention. We do have large groups consuming these. Well, so when it comes to the component of behavioral change, I did comment that in the countries we are doing investigation, research, together with the University of Florida. And based on all of these results and several workshops that we did, we decided to elaborate this plan, which is a regional market plan, which is a communication plan as well which is for a very specific target population, mothers and fathers of children in preschool age and also in school age. In the target population, in the secondary population, we won't have the caregivers of these children. Here, we have also a series of stages, but we have decided to create categories in a consensus of what would be the creative concepts. And these are for tradition, taste, love, and hidden source. The four creative concepts are those that we have considered at least for this experience on what could influence negatively or positively in the reduction of salt. If a campaign was created, these would be the four determinants uh, to classify the themes that should be worked on. And then this is also published in this website here, IDLBNC, and you will find this both in English and in Spanish. When it comes to the assessment of the health and economic impact, we're going to have to consult, for instance, Costa Rica and Brazil. And we have determined that more than 21% of cardiovascular deaths in Brazil and 15% in Costa Rica, these could be avoided or prevented if the population would reach the levels of intake as recommended by WHO. And this would be the prime model. These data are really important, especially when we find that our national and worldwide 
targets in the reduction of premature mortality on cardiovascular diseases. And this initiative could precisely provide a great contribution and especially in some of those indexes because these other interventions are not being used. So I'm also going to mention the data from Brazil and Costa Rica, which is in the under publication process. We have an estimate of cost and excessive consumption of salt for the Brazilian health system, which was $342 million per year. And this considers hospitalizations, consultations, and medication for hypertension. And what is being used is the impact model developed by the United Kingdom. And here we have this opportunity to have a training course and the support from people in England, which was really important because it benefits Brazil and Costa Rica because Eduardo transferred this knowledge to us. When it comes to the knowledge transfer, we have developed what is called a work plan, which is a book that had all of these stages to accomplish each of the goals. And the idea was to teach countries that they should be moving through different steps to spread the information. And this is nothing more like doing what's being done so far. This is also under a process of publication, but the report is in the page of the digital library website. Some outcomes we've had are that the consortium has established strategic alliances and informed different sectors and also partnerships with power and civil society organizations. This has facilitated the execution of the project activities and the communication of the outputs. We also have a policy brief that is being elaborated for the network. So you would know there is one policy brief for the whole project, gathering all results in a way that is more guided to decision makers. And this is in both languages, English and Spanish. And in the case of Costa Rica, we have made the launch before we ended the project. Dr. Mari Labez was part of the activity that was focused on decision makers like the authorities of the Ministry of Health of Costa Rica. And this is the link that you can access in English and in Spanish. Now, just because we have this, you can now find plenty of information about different projects. There are several gaps that we are still attentive to which is counting on the monitoring that is sustainable, and what is the labeling of food. And also we are advancing with Dr. Mary Lave in some countries. We're going to monitor this year with the support from the Results to Save Lives, the fund from PAHO. And it would be good for more countries to keep doing this, so we are going to have eco-sustainable goals that are updated in national goals the country has. And also the update of the goals that already exist, and of course the regional plan that is being guided to mothers and fathers and the population of children in preschool and school age that should be adapted to the context and the meta population that will be defined in each country. And finally, the country's context and the language and several other cultural aspects. In the case of Costa Rica, we are doing it right now. And if you want, this will be ready by the middle of this year. And then the definition of actions in the reduction of sodium in these other types of food should be organized, whether this should be 
regulated or what's going to happen because so far nothing happens except in Argentina when they gathered the northern zone citizens to work together with them but this also requires resources and we should always be aware that in some countries at least the ones that participated in the project the impact has not been assessed because Argentina had done previous studies and that was it. So as a conclusion, this project illustrates the benefits of collaborative work. This is why we highlight how fundamental collaborative work is in these investigations that require the consortium of countries to take place. And it also had the support from the international technical assistance, which was fundamental and it has generated evidence, scientific, regional, and local evidence for decision-making for policies and programs. We also have a series of innovations in food systems that were generated and also a new focus on the technological, political, and methodological approaches. So we could also say that this project constitutes a model for other public health interventions, but there are technicians as food policies and the behavior of the consumers. And finally, I would like to thank you IDRC for the funding that was extremely good and really follow up. That has been so interesting. They are still supporting us until last year. They have helped so much to publish scientific articles that are focusing on this aspect. And we're still having these funds that are helping people publish their results. And from the very beginning, from the conception of the idea or the concept note, the University of Toronto, Ontario, PAHO, and in Ciencia, have participated and in this photograph, we have one of the last meetings of the core group of this project. Well, thank you. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Adriana. It was so interesting. And later we can go back to a round of questions in the end of the last presentation. We would like to invite Professor Gabriela Flores from the University of Argentina that is going to be sharing with us information and details on the experience Argentina has implemented about the mandatory goals and targets. And then we can go back and talk about the presentation of Dr. Adriana and the considerations brought by Gabriela what's been implemented in Argentina. Let's see if Gabriela is here. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Gabriela. Well, so first of all, I would like to thank you. I don't know if you can hear me, can you? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Thank you. I would like to thank for the invitation on behalf of the Ministry of Health of Argentina, both for the Pan-American Health Organization as well for the Ministry of Health in Brazil. It is such a pleasure to be here sharing this with you. And I don't know if you can see the presentation. Yes. Good. So we're going to present, I'm going to present the national policy for the reduction in the consumption of sodium in Argentina, and more specifically, the part that is related to the mandatory uh, targets for the reduction of the sodium levels in food. Very quickly, because tomorrow I'm going to be discussing this theme a little further. In Argentina, the policy for sodium reduction started in 2009, and it was made of an initial voluntary stage developed from voluntary agreements, and then the mandatory stage that started with the sanction of law 26,905, and one of the products that are there are related to the establishment of the maximum sodium targets for some food items. 
We do have the law for voluntary reduction four years ago, where Argentina became the first country in Latin America and the second one in the world after South Africa to sanction a law to promote the reduction in the sodium intake. This law has as a general objective the reduction of sodium intake in the Argentinian population. And tomorrow, I can mention this in further details, but one of those axes are related to the incorporation of maximum limits of sodium in the Argentinian Food Codex. We have a quick comment here that is related to the fact that the Food Codex of Argentina is a rule which regulates all the commercialization and sales of foods in the country. So our country is a federal country and each province has full capacity to determine their own laws in case they want. And all the provinces of the national territory have adhered to the law 18,284, which is the one that started this food codex but everything that was found in this food codex is going to be effectively going to be accomplished and executed in all of the national territory, which is important because every change in the codex reflects in the whole country. I think there is another microphone open. I don't know if it's mine here. Thank you. Within the law 26,905, we have the mandate from the Ministry of Health, which is the authority that applies the law, to have new reductions done in the products that are still incorporated, incorporating different products with the maximum limits of sodium in this food codex. When the law was regulated four years after the sanction the sodium limits were incorporated in the food codex in a way that this was achieved through reductions made uh, through volunteer processes, voluntary processes. As I said, the law provides a mandate for the Ministry of Health to be able to establish new sodium limits, both for the foods that are already incorporated in the food codex, as well as the new ones which is actually a very long and complex process with different points to complete, involving first determining the products that are going to be having a reduction in sodium or the ones that are going to be worked on. And for this, what is done is to look at two issues. We have products that are there because they have a very high percentage of sodium when it comes to uh, the milligrams per 100, regardless of the consumption, or some products that do not have such high percentage of sodium, but they are actually broadly consumed by the population. So we consider it this way that these contribute to, with sodium in a way that is very important in the consumption of the people, the citizens of the country. Once the definition is made, between the governmental actors that are participating, we're going to be doing a multi-sectoral invitation for a round table involving different government sectors that are being led by the National Program of Healthy Eating and Obesity Prevention, which depend on the direction of the whole approach moving on communicable diseases in the health ministry. We also have the National Institute of Health, which is part of the Ministry of Health, which involves using more techniques involved in the making of foods and also having inspection of foods. And as in the country, we have this program for control and surveillance for the reduction of sodium in Argentina. So these are responsible for the program. 
We also have the participants, uh, the participation of other people from the Secretariat of Interior Commerce, because they are the focal point for everything that has to do with food legislation in Mercosur. And uh, we had the participation of the National Service for uh, Food as well. And depending on what we have, depending on the group of foods, we have the participation of the Technical uh, Institute and other association of dairy producers, but that depends on the category of foods that is going to uh, be worked on. We also have the participation of industrial chambers and we communicate with the companies that produce the foods that are going to suffer from the reduction. And once we have that, we have a call for uh, a panel to renegotiate with the industry. The first point is to analyze what is the content of sodium in the selected products. And here uh, we ask companies to facilitate the data about the products that they produce. And we also analyze the percentage of the market uh, that these companies represent, because we never have all of the companies, of course, but for a reduction, we need the companies to cover at least 80% of the market share with their products so that we can ensure an important and significant representation of the sector. After analyzing the content and the averages, and we see the sodium that we have in these products, then we have an evaluation done on the technological feasibility for the reduction of sodium. And here, the most important thing is to assess the type of food matrix that we're talking about. In certain foods, sodium has basically sensorial uh, roles, but in other foods, we have a microbiological quality, the amount of product, and other things. And in certain products, it's easier to reduce sodium, but in others, a more complex technology is required. Like for example, in the case of cheese, which is a problem when we have to reduce salt because in our country, most producers, they are small and medium-sized companies. So once we carry out all of these evaluations, we define and establish a limit of sodium for a certain product. And an important matter is that this is the hardest part of the negotiation. And then you have proposals, counter proposals, and negotiations between the industry and the coordination of the panel. An important thing is since the limits are mandatory and they are incorporated in the food codex, they can, uh, th there can be sanctions. So it's always the most difficult part of negotiation, it's tense. The law to reduce sodium in a country creates a national advisory commission to promote the reduction of uh, sodium. And we have the participation uh, in addition to the uh, corporate chambers that represent the companies and the actors that I mentioned on the part of the state, we also have the participation of the academy, uh, the universities and uh, civil society associations. So once these steps are done uh, to establish and define new limits, uh, the proposal is presented to be approved by the National Commission. That would be uh, the approval that is not really binding because it's a moment in which we're going to listen to the voices that were not present during the negotiation process for the reduction of the limit of sodium. 
once the National Committee uh, provides comments and approves, then a project to change the national uh, code uh, is done. And that is done together with National Institute of Food and other institutions. And then the proposal is presented to the Food National Committee and uh, this is, committee can change the proposal or not. Once the proposal is accepted, then the new limit for sodium is incorporated. And as you can see, those are processes that take a long, a long of time. Uh, it, it's a bit easier for certain foods, but for you to have an idea to get to this last part here, to the incorporation uh, of that, that took 14 months as you can see, so that you can have an idea of how long it takes. Sometimes the process takes a long time. With respect to the changes that were done in the food code when the law was regulated in 2017, we had incorporation of meats and products and uh, derivatives and also soups and flowers. You had big categories and subcategories. In addition, each sub subcategory had different products. For example, in meats, you have different types of meats and you have the ones that are cooked and the ones that are not, the ones that are fresh, the ones that are dry, and you have different types of foods. So this is very uh, broad. These products that participated, uh, the limits were translated into limits because uh, when it was voluntary, it was percentages of reduction. But now they were translated into limits, into maximums. And that was incorporated into the 2017 law. In 2018, two proposals to change were presented. One that had to do with the second reduction to meats. Uh, and the other one had to do with the reduction in uh, flour products. In 2019, two proposals to change were presented. And then we had the second reduction for soups. And we incorporated sodium limits for mayonnaise. Uh, and in the other proposals, we had the incorporation of new products. For example, ketchup and the basis for ketchup, this Gulf uh, sauce and uh, tomato sauce. And here we found uh, problems because, for example, these sauces, they were not defined in the food code. Our food code has a few products that are not established as such but they can be approved. There's an article that allows for their approval if all of the ingredients are part of the code. But it wasn't possible to put a limit uh, on sodium to a food that did not exist on the code. So we needed to come up with a consensus for definition for this product so that we could incorporate all that. In 2020, because of the health uh, conditions that we all know, no proposals were presented. And in 2021, two new proposals to reduce sodium were presented. In this case, a third one for snacks and, and uh, these other gadgeta types of snacks and cookies. And in this case, also basis for uh, mustard. But in our country, the percentage of uh, table used mustard uh, is like 3%. So this, they are all imported. There's no national production for that. And actually that was going to be a very complex process for the very little use and, and sales that they have for mustard. So we decided not to work with that. So these are the limits that we would have for the first and second uh, products, uh, each one of the categories of foods. As I told you, we have a lot of products for the categories. And here we have the third reduction in the case of snacks and also these additions. When we uh, assessed that with the previous rules from the Pan-American uh, Organization, Health Organization, they 
all uh, met the limits except for one small subcategory. So this is one of the points uh, that are going to guide our next actions. In the short term, we are wor we've been working for a year and a half now to incorporate uh, sodium limits so that these Quartiolo, Port Salud, and Cremoso types of cheeses uh, can have that. And so 65% of the cheese production in Argentina belong to small and medium-sized companies. They don't have the technology to ensure the amount of sodium in the end product. So for the first time, we had an agreement to establish a tolerance uh, percentage to this limit for the sodium, given the complexity of the food matrix. And this has to do, I, I'm not going to uh, speak too much about this, but this has to do with the fact that the sodium, the way it is produced uh, for cheese, it's not so easy to control because it's not an ingre ingredient that is added to the food. It's an ingredient that is part of the production. So it's very complex. For the same reason, the National um, Industrial Technology Institute is going to provide assistance to these small companies, these small cheese producers, so that they can carry out sodium reduction. We are at, in the end stages of this process discussing the limit that is going to be incorporated. And we believe that this year we're going to finally be able to have a proposal uh, to change uh, these products. Regarding the challenges that we have ahead of us, first, we need to establish priorities to open new uh, reformulation uh, panels so that we can uh, have new um, WHO and PAHO goals uh, compatible with the limits that we have in our Argentinian food code. And we also, at this time, in which we are in this regulation process for this uh, healthy food uh, law. It includes a lot of other things in addition to labels. This is taking up a lot of our time because we are uh, working on these regulations and the technical panels. But we believe that this is a good moment to support other policies that also help in the reduction of sodium in foods. And this seems crucial to us. And also to improve the monitoring of the content of sodium in foods by means of the strengthening of the labs of, uh, provincial, of the provinces tomorrow. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. To conclude, the work in interdisciplinary panels uh, on the sodium reduction together with the industry allows us to understand the particularities of each food matrix. Because when we, uh, the technicians are the ones who sit down and discuss things. So it's important for the panels to talk about products in the same subcategory. It would be a mistake to discuss uh, sodium limits on products that are different and they're not going to be able to share the limit. Uh, we should have technical support of experts in the case uh, that it is necessary. The processes are long, uh, but they arrive at a good uh, on good terms. And it's important that the process is led by health so that we don't uh, lose sight of the fact that it, this is a sanitary policy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gabriela. Thank you for your presentation. So now I'm going to speak Portuguese. We have a few minutes left before we close our first day of the seminar. So I'd like to take this opportunity to ask if anyone has questions, doubts, if you would like to ask our last two presenters. I'm going to begin with this question asked by Eduardo. He was asking Adriana and then 
Oh, first for Adriana and then for Gabriela. So Dr. Dana, how can you keep on doing the transfer technology and knowledge in the IDRC project for the countries that are part of the action network that we mentioned? Well, the transfer to other countries, although the project has ended, the transfer can be done. Sometimes we did that on, a, on an individual manner. You can contact me. We've also transferred, as I said, in the technical advisory group of uh, PAHO. And also uh, people were specifically contacted as Eduardo did to help other countries to do this estimate on the impact on health and the initiative. And also we had consultations and inquiries done. Now that we will have a new monitoring, uh, they asked me for a series of documentations from the part of uh, PAHO. Let's say uh, we have not had a specific one because the project uh, ended. And we have other projects now on similar themes and on the same theme as well. But if you ask us as much as we can, we can support you and we can provide you with guidance. That's how we've been working. So if you have suggestions uh, by means of the network and Eduardo, we could see if other uh, ways could be found that might be uh, more efficient maybe to work. Thank you, Adriana. Tomorrow we're going to have another space to discuss with representatives from the countries themselves. And maybe we can think about a way to use the results of the project and to get in touch. So I, I think that can be an opportunity for us to discuss this tomorrow. So Eduardo also has a question for Gabriela about the monitoring of the goals. If an evaluation of the costs was done and the representativeness of the uh, bromatological analysis of the products. Gabriela, would you like to answer that? Actually, cost evaluation was not done. We are very self-critical with our policies, so we believe that uh, if we have a national program uh, for monitoring and inspection, but uh, it's although uh, we have that, it's the weakest part that we have in terms of inspection. Uh, we have a lab analysis and we have a lab, lab network that are there. And they have, uh, they are controlled by this National Food uh, Institute. And this institute does then uh, analysis of these foods and uh, uh, provincial rheumatological analysis, not some of them, not all of them they perform analysis on regional products. One of the problem, problems is that not all uh, rheumatological uh, analysis are done in the provinces. We have 24 provin provinces and the city of Buenos Aires, and not all of the provinces or states have uh, equipped laboratories to conduct these analysis. At this time, our board is funding, and we are in the last stage of that. Uh, we are purchasing, we already had a bid done, and uh, everything was approved. In the next few months, we're going to acquire elements uh, and equipment for the lab for 10 provinces. So I think this is going to favor the number of analysis that are done because there's no representativeness. Although we have a lot of analysis per year, the amount of products 
sold in Argentina is very high. We are a very big industry. So we believe it is necessary to strengthen the entire system. So it's one of the po critical points for us and that we're working on it. I don't know if I answered your question. I do think you did, right, Eduardo? We also have another question from Dr. Adriana for our presentation. Dr. Adriana, please. Yes, it is very interesting to see how the work has been done in Argentina on the targets for sodium reduction and the whole process started a long time ago and we do know how much experience you have, the good team you have as well. And we are noticing the differences that we see in the little ones like in Costa Rica. Then we've been working in a way which is very, very simple. But I do think we should improve. For example, the proposals that were elaborated based on the targets we had established from PAHO, as well as the numbers we know, we knew about the situation of the nutritional labels and some other analysis we made, and another series of inputs and insights from investigations we did considering these proposals and working closely to the sectors, working with the sectors that we had identified as being the main ones to contribute for the sodium consumption. And these are all mediated by the Chamber of the Food Industry. We participated in the Costa Rican study in research and investigation in nutrition and health in an effort of the industry together with the Ministry of Health. But now I see that you are doing very important preliminary work that many institutions of the government are involved from what I can see. And my first question is, in these institutions, do you have this first analysis to define the limits, at least the preliminary limits, and is academia involved? and civil society from this moment? Or is it just a single institution from the government? I'm saying this because since now we have to negotiate, I'm sure we should be improving the way to do this because we were, there is no doubt, dealing with the industry. And the fact that I see right now in this question, which says that you should be negotiating with the industry, even though you do have your mandatory targets, and that you should be working together with the industry because it should be feasible in one hand within the possibilities. And there are arguments to demonstrate through data that there is such strong variability in some places and in others as expected. So my question is, I don't see that the industry is joining the conversation right in the end of it. So I'm thinking about a national commission, the one that decides the proposals, if they're going to be accepted. And I do imagine that if this is occurring in the national commission, it is not including the industry, right? So this is what I want to know. We don't have to name names. Where are these governmental institutions? Is academia or NGOs involved? So we can see a structure that is a little more convenient. Thank you. Let me comment on this. In the initial stage, academia did not participate. Those who participate are the ministries and the national direction of food and beverage from the Ministry of Agriculture and cattle raising and fishing and the productive sector is involved, uh, represented by the National Institute of Foods and the coordination of the national foods of healthy eating and obesity prevention from the government. And then we have other sectors like the national uh, security and safety uh, food habits. And also we also have the industrial technology depending on the theme or the national direction's decision. And we have the chambers and we have the industry. I know sometimes it is rare for the definition of the boundaries are established. 
together with the industry. But what is important to understand is that these are not voluntary targets. These are limits that are meant to be effectively fulfilled. And if we do not ensure that the industry is capable of executing that, especially the small and medium entrepreneurs, especially because the large industries, they usually have a technology to make these changes. So if they're not doing it, they will be sanctioned from the economic perspective and the merchandise is going to be seized from the sale points. So we should be compensating in a way to be completely sure that this is the limit and that everyone, every producer is capable of being accordingly. There is much discussion in our country in this sense, and it's something that we want to study a little more in details. And there are many fools that are under those limits, right? But this limit, it should be reaching everyone, every product. So it is not just a goal that we want to reach. It's something mandatory that the law demands you to do. So it's different. And this is why we're talking about maximum limits and not targets, because our targets are the ones that are established by the regional sanitary authority. In this case, it's PAHO. So these are not the targets to accomplish, but we do know that a micro enterprise or a small one, it's not very likely they can produce fresh cheese or cream with 280 milligrams of sodium, that is almost zero because this will depend on the immersion time, the temperature and the recirculation in the machinery they have, you know. So this means that the large companies are capable of doing this. So we are following uh, the law of the, uh, regarding the labels that should be according to the PAHO profile. And this will help, help traction all of the large companies to have reductions in sodium, and more importantly, in products in which, in which they're close, that they're feasible to do this reduction. Just like in these discussions that we still have to work on because certain products are still very far from reaching the targets, you know. And then in all of these products, if we don't keep tractioning and pressing with the law, they're not going to lower the sodium level. So according to the National Commission, the National Commission is part of the industry, but these are chambers. It's not that we have companies doing this. And if academia is participating, for instance, we have different universities, we have all of the brigades that are working on healthcare and nutrition more specifically. I don't know if the Argentinian Society of Cardiology, the Society of Hypertension or Diabetes or Nutrition, FIC, for instance, the, found the Inter-American Foundation for the Heart. So there are many different types of civil society organizations involved, and these are the same actors that are participating in the technical discussions. And there are other governmental actors that are also being invited in the chambers as well. So if for example, it happened that all of the commission has approved a reduction and the chamber does not agree. So we're going to present the proposal with the chambers and that did not agree, but still the proposal is presented. It's not really bonding, you know, to participate in this commission. It happens that the commission is completely opposed to some of the proposals. But this, once again, for me, it's important to differentiate between the targets that should be more strict, of course, and the limits that are going to be produced 
of a food that is outside of the limits will have an economic sanction against the company or the product will be removed from the commercialization, which is also an economic sanction. So uh, we're asking about economic sanctions. I don't know the answer. This is not really my department. So I don't really know what, how this works. You know, I could verify for you, but right now I don't know. I don't know. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. I just wanted to know if uh, the universities were involved at first. No, no. In the end, with the National Commission, they do, right? Yes, this involves a very large structure, and this involves the size of the country. And I believe since we are looking at places that are more distant, like my family is from Argentina, so I do know the differences my mother's family is from there. So I do know the difference when it comes to sanctions and different habits that different peoples have. So this is on the level of Buenos Aires, for instance. How is this going? What we're doing is virtual meetings at this moment, right? So they can participate from different spaces. And also we make sure to invite the large companies in Buenos Aires that are being trans doing the transportation of all of these. And we're inviting different chambers here. Those that are going to be adding small, medium-sized companies, especially now in the process of sodium reduction in the cheeses, which has been quite difficult due to the chambers representing the large companies. So we have finished now the negotiation stage. We have agreed on the proposals. They did the counter proposal. We didn't agree. So the negotiation took place in order to reduce those limits. But we are still with the chamber of micro, small and medium enterprises discussing the theme of the lack of uh, technology in these companies for that. So we're looking at the parallel programs that can provide assistance. We have the National Institute of Industrial Technology, for example, that is going to be providing technical assistance for these companies so they can be doing the reduction processes. If we put the sodium limits based on the large companies alone. None of the small enterprises would be able to sell any of these products. So this is very close to local producers and we do have a large quantity of local producers. So when we established those limits in the food code, it is very important to review the small and medium-sized industry, which is an important workforce and a very important source of income for the people in the country. We do know that the large industry will be able to adapt and this will have the technology and the technical requirements necessary to do it. But it's not the same for the small and medium-sized companies, but when the limits are established for sodium, for instance, or creamy cheese, we don't differentiate whether this is a multinational company producing it or if it's a small company with four employees. So for us, the cheese is all the same. So this is why this classification is being done according to the food code of Argentina. And we should be confident that the small industry is able to accomplish that. Because if not, they cannot sell their products. It's very complex, right? This is why we are saying this. The country is large. We do have many small companies. So we are producing a large quantity of food indeed. Thank you, Gabriela. Eduardo, before I pass the floor to you, I saw Gabriela already answered Zaira about the sanctions and what happens to companies that are not accordingly. And I don't know if you're going to comment on the same thing, but Leo's asking. 
whether Argentina has tried to elaborate the targets without the industry participation, because he's worried about the negotiation and consensus process, um, making the process very long and resulting in not very ambitious targets because the PAHO and WHO targets were not adopted since they are scientifically validated worldwide. And there has been an analysis that they're feasible to implement. I'm sorry, I don't know if you answered that already, Gabriela, but I'll pass the floor to Eduardo as well, since we have only a few minutes left. So this is a final round of questions. Eduardo, please. Thank you, Lorenza. I'd just like to highlight a message from Adriana. I asked the question, but this is part of the answer, really, that we're still available here to make contact with these countries and the project is now collaborating with Mexico in producing sodium data in Paraguay as well. And this was used for different countries as well, for trans fats and methodologies have helped so much in the regulatory process in Brazil. And now we're working together with Argentina. And second, I would like to highlight why I asked this question. The discussion in different places like Brazil is that when you include a regulatory measure, you have the extra cost of inspection and how it encompasses so much. So we do have the regulatory agencies that this is going through not only in the matter of sodium, but in many others as well. And you know why I'm asking, because this is a common thing to different countries. Often the cost of inspection could be used as an argument against the regulatory measure itself. So this will increase the economic factors that could be used from the health side so we can advocate for our theme. Thank you, Eduardo. I apologize. I had misunderstood, I think. I thought you were talking about cost assessment, about the costs involved with diseases. In our case, we never really talked about costs involved with inspection because this is a national food institute that does this through a laboratory that was assembled in the first line. And the problem is really the analysis itself. We have the detection of sodium that can be done with photometers that are equipment that is much more economical. In the case of trans fats, we have equipment that costs around $50,000 each. So this makes it much more complicated. This is why inspection is weaker in certain points. So I misunderstood the question. I do apologize though. And what about the targets? Why not adopt the WHO PAHO targets? I think you answered this one, right? Basically, that's it, you know. The reality is we, if we use the PAHO targets, these are technologically viable, but not for all the companies. So this is why. So a goal is not the same as a limitation. This is something that I'd like to make clear because a goal is something to reach. It's something that uh, promotes everything. So we count on these goals, but the limit on the cold, if you say 500, it can't be 501, it's 500. So we need to make sure that all other products can meet those limits. That's why they're not goals. They are maximum limits of sodium and they can uh, suffer from punishments and sanctions by small and medium-sized companies. Thank you very much, Gabriel, I understood. So we are on time here. It's one o'clock, uh, 1 p.m. here, Brasilia time. I'd like to thank you all for your presence. It was a very productive, very fruitful morning. Uh, so we will be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. Brasilia time to go deeper in the strategies and experiences of the countries that are part of the network. We will also have the participation of Paraguay. 
I will very briefly pass the floor to Eduardo so that he can uh, conclude. And I'd like to thank you everyone again. I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you very much. Eduardo, you have the floor. Yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone too. And Dr. Mary, I'd like to thank you, Adriana, uh, Leo, uh, Gabriela, because the idea of this first day was to bring a contextualization of all of these evidences, all of this work that was done in our Latin American region, and to bring experts on the themes that was very important. The support of PAHO to the project is essential. And so tomorrow we can go deeper on national policies and we can continue. So uh, this is because our idea to continue with these virtual meetings is to have new meetings. And this is going to have a more general uh, outlook, but the idea is to have themes having in mind what Adriana detailed in terms of different outlooks that we can, we need to have about the policies, uh, for example, uh, food uh, carts and um, street uh, food and all of that, because uh, there are many gaps that we need to fill uh, in terms of policy. So that's a bit what we're thinking about in the future. And I'd also like to wish everyone uh, a good day and may tomorrow we have a wonderful discussion like the one we had today. And thank you again for your presence and participation. That's right. Thank you very much. See you all tomorrow. See you. Thank you very much.